Hi, AP Chemistry students. It's Miss Johnson, and we're picking up at the end of the Chapter 4 notes with redox reactions. I want to start by looking at this reaction that we saw qualitatively happen in class today. We had solid aluminum or alu tin foil, and we mixed in the copper chloride, that blue solution. And what we saw was the cop solid copper forming. It was that brown or orangey looking stuff. And the aluminum actually began to, um, it almost looked like it disintegrated. If you saw it by the end of the class, there was no solid aluminum left. That's because all of the aluminum went into the aqueous phase. It was dissolved as ions in the solution. Copper took its electrons. So I would challenge you now to balance out this equation. Once it's balanced, try to write the net ionic equation for what was happening. There's certainly a spectator ion here who had nothing to do with, well, little to do with the reaction. Right, so I would say pause the video now. I'm going to reveal the answer in just a moment. All right, here is the net ionic equation, correct and balanced out. One thing to note on net ionic equations, um, the number of atoms on each side should be balanced, but the charges on each side should be balanced, the overall charge. So we can see here that we have a positive six charge in total on the left side and a positive six charge in total on the right side when we do two times plus three and three times plus two. So here's the, the net ionic equation. It's easy to see that aluminum had something happening with the electrons because it charge changes. Copper, same thing. All right, so when we're looking at redox reactions, it is all about where did the electrons go, who took them, who lost them. This stuff gets really important when we start talking about batteries and uh, like chrome plating on cars and stuff like that, gold plating on jewelry. But for now, we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg, which is figuring out where the electrons are moving around in redox reactions. There's a little mnemonic device that I find super helpful, and I say it every time I'm working with redox reactions, and that's oil rig. So as you're writing, I'll explain. Oil, O-I-L, stands for oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction, rig, is, sorry, rig stands for reduction is gain of electrons. So we're always referencing the electrons here. Your job usually with redox reactions for now is to figure out what gets oxidized and what gets reduced. So one more time, oxidation is the loss of electrons and then reduction is the gain of electrons. And you may not think that that makes a lot of sense, uh, but it does when we start looking at the charges because it's all about what happens to the charges on species. Species act differently and they look different when their charges change, so that's why we care about them so much. So if something is losing electrons, like aluminum up here, aluminum loses re electrons and it has an increase in charge. And that should make sense because as it loses electrons, we're taking away negative charges. So it's left with an overall positive charge. Reduction, on the other hand, it's the gain of electrons. As something gets reduced, like the copper, it's gaining more positive charge. So its charge gets lower. It reduces. And that should make sense. It sounds a little weird at first, but once you work it out in your head, hopefully you can commit it to memory. And what this says in parentheses here is an increase or more positive charge. So the aluminum went from zero charge to a plus three charge. It got more positive. Right, so you really need to work out why that makes sense in your head. And you may want to like do some thinking about that before you move on with the video. Um, the other way that we can, the other thing that you need to know is oxidation numbers or oxidation states. So in this equation, it's really easy to see that electrons are moving around, and it's pretty easy to see who's gained them and who's lost them because there's only zero charge or positive charge. Um, some reactions that we'll look at that are redox reactions, it doesn't outwardly look like anything is changing charge or losing electrons, but it, in fact, is um, a redox reaction. So the first one that we'll look at here is this reaction. And this reaction may look familiar to you. We saw it earlier in the week, um, when we were talking about combustion reactions. So we have magnesium ribbon burning in oxygen to give us magnesium oxide. Hint, hint, it's a redox reaction. All combustion reactions are redox reactions. This one is nice and balanced. We don't see any charges. So it's not obvious that there's an electron transfer taking place, but there is, in fact. The way that we figure out where the electrons go is by assigning oxidation states to every single atom that is involved in this reaction. And that sounds crazy, but it's not actually that strange. You actually, you probably have the tools to do this already, you just don't know it. So if I asked you, let's look at this magnesium atom here, what's the charge on it? We can see that it's magnesium by itself. Hopefully you're realizing it has a zero charge. That's the same as its oxidation state in this, purpose, in this case. So magnesium's oxidation state is zero, and I'm going to put a line through it so you know that's not a zero, not, not an O. I'm going to skip oxygen for now, 
And let's look at MgO. So we have magnesium and oxygen combined in a compound. Think back to your um, formula naming days of, of chemistry one. If I asked you what charge oxygen usually takes when it forms compounds, what would you say? Hopefully you're thinking it's a negative two charge. And that is, in fact, oxygen's oxidation state here. Oxygen doesn't necessarily have a negative two charge once it's combined in the compound, but for the state of figuring out what's lost and gained electrons, we give it its oxidation state of negative two. Magnesium, if I asked you what, form, uh, what charge it usually takes when it forms compounds, you'd probably say, looking at your periodic table, plus two. And that is its oxidation state here. Oxidation states are usually the charge that things take when, they've, when they are in their ion forms. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean that this magnesium has a positive two charge on it. It's just for tracking the electrons and where they go. So this oxygen here, so O2, we've got two oxygens, and I'm going to write these out separately because we have to assign the oxidation state on each of them. The, it will be the same oxidation state uh, since the oxygens are combined together in the same molecule. <coughs> now it's two oxygens combined together, so they're not really going to hog electrons differently. They both have the same pull on electrons. They both have the same valence shell. So it is going, each of these is going to have a zero oxidation state on them. Okay. You can see here that our total oxidation states on this side are zero if we add them all up. And on the right hand side of the equation adds up to zero. Your charges always have to balance out, or your oxidation states, excuse me, have to balance out. So those are what oxidation states are. We can now look at this and see what got oxidized and what got reduced. Magnesium went from a zero to a two plus. That means its charge increased, so it must have lost electrons. Magnesium, if it's losing electrons, oxidation is lost. So it gets, Mg gets oxidized, and I'll abbreviate. If magnesium gets oxidized, then probably oxygen is reduced, but let's just double check. Oxygen over here had a zero oxidation state, now it has a negative two. It's gained electrons, so it has been reduced. Reduction is gain, so the oxygen got reduced. So we can see now that it doesn't look like there was an electron transfer happening, but in fact there was. We had oxygen taken on electrons from magnesium in order to form this compound. So on the back side of your page, there's some basic rules for redox reactions. And again, these are probably coming from your formula naming days. If you have an atom in the elemental form, just by itself, sodium, magnesium, allotropes, those would be things that combine with themselves, like N2, O2, S8, it's a common one you may not know of. Anytime we have something like this, all of the elements will have a zero oxidation state. Every sulfur here has an oxidation state of zero because they're not likely to pull electrons differently than the other sulfurs around them. They're all sulfur. Monoatomic ions, those are single atoms that are in their ion form like Na plus or Cl minus. The oxidation state on either of these guys is going to be the same as the charge on the ion. So Na plus, it has a plus one oxidation state, just like it's plus one charge. Same for Cl minus, it would have a negative one oxidation state. Fluorine in compounds, so sodium fluoride. If I asked you what charge fluorine has here, just from your formula days, hopefully you'd tell me it's negative one, and that is always the oxidation state we'll assign when we're trying to figure out what's oxidized and what's reduced. Fluorine always takes negative one when it's in compounds. <coughs> Hydrogen in covalent compounds like water. Hopefully you're thinking hydrogen usually has a charge of plus one. That is the, char the oxidation state that we would give it when we're seeing what's getting reduced and what's getting oxidized. Each of these hydrogens would have a plus one. The oxygen would have a negative two. In total, that would give us zero. And water doesn't have a charge on it, so that should make sense. The exception to that is metal hydrides, like oh, magnesium hydride, MgH2. H is at the end. Magnesium would have the positive oxidation state. Hydrogen has the negative one oxidation state. These are rare examples. I don't expect you to see them too much. And then oxygen. In most covalent compounds like CO3, H2O, CO2, or in any formula where you're trying to like name something oxygen, its uh, oxidation state will be negative two. In peroxides, that's the only exception. 
H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Here, oxygen is going to have a different oxidation state. Each of these hydrogens has a plus one. The oxygens are each going to take on a negative one. This is the only exception for oxygen that you need to remember is in hydrogen peroxide or peroxides like that. And then for any given molecule or compound, the sum of the oxidation states should add up to the overall charge on the compound. This is a way to check if your oxidation states are correct. So a polyatomic ion like SO4, 2 minus. That's sulfate. We've got one sulfur and four oxygens. If you assigned an oxidation state to the sulfur and all of the oxygens, and then you added it all together, it should add up to negative two. Okay, nitrate NO3 minus, if you assign your oxidation states, should add up to negative one, because it has a negative one charge. It's a good way to check yourself. And then just be aware, you can have non-integer oxidation states, like in this compound, if you try to work it out by giving each oxygen a negative two, you would find that um, iron has a non, uh, a fraction for its oxidation state. Never seen it tested on the AP exam, but I just want you to know if you see it in the homework, um, you may not be wrong if you're getting a fraction for your answer. All right, let's try to assign oxidation states to these guys. Um, carbon and CO2, excuse me. We'll start off with the oxygen because we know what it is coming from these rules up here. I don't really know what oxidation state carbon usually takes, but oxygen has a negative two. Since there are two oxygens here, we're going to multiply it to give us a negative four. And remember that there's no charge on carbon dioxide, so overall the oxidation states have to add up to zero since there's no charge on this molecule. If the oxygens are negative four, the carbons must be positive four to make this arithmetic work out. So carbon has an oxidation state of plus four, and oxygen has an oxidation state, each oxygen has an oxidation state of negative two. For SF6, the fluorines from our rules above have an oxidation state of negative one, but there are six of them. So in total, I got negative six right now. If I want all this stuff to add up to zero, because there's no charge on the molecule, sulfur must be a positive six. So sulfur has an oxidation state of plus six. Fluorine has an oxidation state, each one of them, of minus one. So try that last one on your own. Hopefully you'll find out that oxygen has an oxidation state of negative two and nitrogen has an oxidation state of plus five. Each of these oxygens has an oxidation state of negative two. And then the very last problem. Here we've got a, an oxidation reduction reaction. It's um, lead, sulfide, and oxygen reacting, and then there's a secondary reaction to go along with it. Your job is to identify the atoms that are oxidized and reduced. To do that, you have to first assign oxidation states to everything, every single atom in this equation, and then figure out which atoms, is it the lead, the sulfur, the oxygen, that's losing electrons from the left side to the right side, and which atoms are gaining electrons. So you're doing that by looking at the oxidation state. Try this on your own, and then we will pick up here in class.